bulletin board, the online of the 1980s. They were the main reason you bought a modem when I was growing up, and in this video I'm going to get to talk about them, see how they work, and also build one in the most obnoxiously modern way possible. Yes, yeah, strap in, this is going to get inordinately nerdy. But before we get into the nitty gritty, time for a quick word from our sponsor, PCBWay. Fine purveyor of printed circuit boards. Yep, that's what PCB stands for in case you're wondering. They also do 3D printing, CNC machining. And if you enjoy surface mount soldering as much as I do, they have a pick and place service so you never have to do it again. Although to be honest, I'd just get them to do the passives because they carry them in stock and that's, that's a lot cheaper. So I guess we should start with what is a VBS? Because looking at the age demographics that my videos hit, apparently quite a few of you weren't around for when BBSs were a thing. God, I feel old. Now, weirdly, looking around for how a few other people have defined it, a whole bunch of you describe it as it was kind of like the internet, but before the internet. Which, as statements go, has a, has a few problems. Let's start with the like the internet. Well, it's, it, it's not really like the internet at all in some ways. Well, in a lot of ways, like how it operates and almost kind of like what it does. And then there's the before the internet part, because that's not 100% true either, depending on how you look at it. ARPANET, which was the core of the internet when it first got started, well, that first came into existence in 69, so the internet definitely predates us using bulletin boards, because it predates the microcomputer, and, and for bulletin boards to come into existence, we needed the microcomputer revolution, which has not happened yet. I think what people mean when they say before the internet is that for the first big chunk of the internet's history, unless you were at a university or an institution or part of the US military, you didn't really have access to the internet. When we first started getting ISPs and the ability to dial up to the internet, bulletin boards had already been a thing we were doing with our computers and modems for quite a while before then. So for those of us who used BBSs, our access to them came a long time before we got access to the internet. It was our first taste of an online world where we could chat and message people we'd never met before, discuss topics. You know, the sorts of things that we do now with social media, just before social media. In fact, quite a long time before social media. But BBSs could also be a source of software, games, utilities, PD, shareware. And with some bulletin boards, things that were definitely not PD or shareware. In fact, some bulletin boards would provide a very important role in the world of software piracy, particularly for games. They were also very important in the demo scene as a way of, well, spreading those demos. So let's get into the details of how a bulletin board works and how typically one might come into existence. Now, most bulletin board systems were set up either by an individual, just one person who really felt like it's a thing that they wanted to do, or a group of friends that wanted to do it together. In fact, there are people who go so far as to say that if it was set up by a company or commercial entity, it wasn't really a bulletin board. And while there were systems set up by companies, these were the absolute minority case. Although there was the odd bulletin board system set up by a few individuals that grew so large it became a necessity to become a business in order to run it. So I'll go over the typical case that's usually one person, a computer and a number of phone lines. Now, BBSs weren't just implemented on one platform. It wasn't like it was just a PC thing. In the US, that might have been the most common type of machine that they were run on. But you'd also find BBS software available for Amigas, Apple Macs, even some of the common home 8-bit platforms were used as machines to run BBSs, although those are quite few and far between. Well, I certainly know of at least one BBS that was run from a Commodore 64 and a couple of floppy disk drives, although most would have considered having a hard drive as kind of the base requirement for running a BBS. You would also see people using BBC Micros to run video tech systems, which are related to BBSs, but not quite the same. I'll, I'll, I'll cycle back to those in a bit. The local BBS I used when I was a kid was run using an Amiga 500 and a GVP A530 accelerator and hard drive, which gave it four whole megabytes of memory, a 68030, and of course, a cussy hard drive. And to me, that BBS was an invaluable source of information and also utilities, as it's not like we had the internet then. It also provided my first experience of, well, sort of email. Again, we'll, we'll come to Fidonet a little bit later on. Now, my local BBS back then was quite posh in some regards, in that it had four whole modems and two ISDN lines. Ooh. 
Now, goodness knows how he attached those to an Amiga 500, because it's got one whole serial port. I'm guessing he must have had some form of multi-port serial card plugged into the GVP's little expansion bus thing. Although it's something he must have created himself or got someone to do for him, because I've not been able to find a commercial offering that provides that option for the Amiga 500, or the GVP expansion port. Most BBSs typically had either one or two modems, with the larger BBSs with more phone lines typically running on a PC, because it was a lot easier to add more serial ports to a PC than it was to most other platforms in a cost-effective way. So how does the connection between you and the BBS work? Well, you'd use whatever your chosen computer was, attach a modem to it, and dial up the telephone number of the BBS. The BBS software at the other end would get an indication of ring on the modem, and would answer the call. From then on out, the connection works, well, basically the same as a dumb serial terminal, like a VT100, for example. In fact, if you connected a modem to a serial terminal and didn't mind typing in the AT commands to make it dial, you could actually use a dumb serial terminal to connect to a BBS. Once you connected, what's sent down the line is the text characters for your terminal software, or terminal, to display, as well as some escape sequences that might do things like change the current color selected, or swap you into using character graphics mode. In fact, most BBSs would use what is known as the ANSI escape sequences to control the user's terminal. Some would also offer a dumb mode where it uses almost no control characters at all, so that older terminals or terminal software could connect to it and still work more or less well enough. In fact, you could even connect up with a teletype machine, although both experiences would be very monochrome and one would be a bit noisier than the other. Now this be a terminal approach worked extremely well for the main bulletin board software, where on almost all of them you could navigate to different notice boards, or threads if you like, where you could post and read what other people had posted. The structure to this is very similar to how forums are built today. Also, like forums today, you'd get the option of direct messaging between you and the other users on that BBS. And this is one of the reasons why having a hard drive kind of became the entry level requirement for being a BBS as these messages could get quite big and needed relatively quick access, or at least compared to the size and access speed of a floppy drive. And this became especially true when BBSs started to become a way to distribute software. Now, you may be wondering, given the description I've given you of how this works like a terminal, where does the whole software downloading part come in? How does that work? Well, for that we use something called X modem, and then later on Y modem, and finally Z modem. Although, to be honest, even by the time we had Z modem, X modem had not gone away. X modem was originally developed by Ward Christiansen in 1977 for his CPM based terminal software, modem.asm. Now, some of you will have just noticed me bringing up CPM then, and of course, in the early history of bulletin boards, CPM was kind of dominant for a while. After all, almost every machine you could buy that ran an operating system ran CPM, at least until that became not true. Anyway, Back to Xmodem. Xmodem was a protocol for doing file transfer between two machines over a modem. Well, in fact, despite the name Xmodem, technically the modem bit is optional. All it needs is a serial link. If you had a null modem cable between two machines, you could still quite happily transfer files between them using Xmodem. Xmodem would transmit a series of 128 byte data blocks, each wrapped in a packet with a header and a single byte checksum at the end of the packet after the data block. The reason the data block was 128 bytes is that's the same size as the default block size for floppy disks in CPM. The header's basically three bytes. The first byte was control code one, or start of header, which is an ASCII control code, and that's not something that really comes up very often, hence the reason for using it. The second byte would be the block number, that weirdly would start at one and not zero. The third byte was then the inverse of the block number. You then get your 128 bytes of data, followed by the checksum. When the machine on the receiving end gets that packet, it calculates out the checksum for the data it's received and checks it matches the final byte of the packet. If it does, then it can send back ACK, and the machine sending the data can send the next packet. If it doesn't, it sends NACK, and the sending end would just resend the same packet, and the receiving end would go through the same loop again. If it continually sent NACK, well, eventually the operation would just time out and we drop back to being a regular terminal again. Once the file transfer was complete, you'd send EOT, end of transmission, and you could just go back to being a regular terminal again. Now, those of you who are mathematically inclined will have realized that a one byte checksum is not really enough to spot all the errors that might occur in 128 bytes of data. So 
it would not be uncommon for an X-Modem transfer to fail in a way that the system didn't detect and just moved on. You just ended up with incorrect data in your file. You may have also spotted that there's absolutely no mechanism to abort a transfer whatsoever. Once it's going, both ends just get stuck in this transmittent ack or knack until they hit the end of the file. If that's a big file and you've decided you don't want it anymore, well, tough. You either just hang up the modem and dial up again, or wait for the thing to just finish. Now, we would get a solution introduced to this in the form of the program YAM, yet another modem program, written by Chuck Forsberg for CPM. And again, it's written for CPM because we're quite early on at this point. The protocol YAM introduced would later get known as Y modem. Now, the first thing it added was the abort concept. So instead of being able to just send NAC or ACK in response to a packet that we got, it could send ASCII character 18 in hex or 24 in decimal, which was can or cancel, which would cause the server to abort and stop sending us packets. And our terminal would know to switch back to normal terminal node because it's the thing that sent can. And probably more importantly, you would also stop using a one byte checksum at the end of the packet and in fact change to a 16 bit CRC which would let the receiving end detect any corruption in the packet. Now, it was not the first program to introduce that 16-bit CRC, as there was something called Xmodem CRC that did the same thing. But YAM was the first time we got it combined with the abort concept as well. YAM also let us increase the size of the data bit of the packet to one kilobyte rather than 128 bytes, which made transfers a little bit more efficient, assuming you didn't have a noisy line with lots of packet corruption on it. Now, another part of the Y modem protocol was batch transfer mode, although it's fair to say that quite a few implementations of Y modem kind of failed to notice this bit of the specification and simply didn't implement it, which is why in some software you'll see Y modem and Y modem batch as transfer protocols that you can use. Now, this was predominantly used for BBSs talking to other BBSs where you had a number of files you wanted to transfer, which is kind of what the FidoNet thing is that we're, again, we're gonna come back to that later. Sorry, FidoNet, I keep doing that to you. Now, if you remember before when I was talking about the packet structure, I said that the data packet started with packet number one rather than zero, which is fairly unusual because most things in the world of low-level computer programming, the index, counting index starts at zero. So this batch transfer took advantage of the fact that data packet zero wasn't a thing. So it could use data packet zero to transmit some extra metadata about the file that was being transmitted. So data packet zero would get loaded up with things like the file name, the create date, modify date even potentially. So the receiving end knew which file it was getting and you could have multiple exchanges this way. Now, this is where it became a little bit of an issue for Y modem implementations that didn't implement this whole zero packet concept in that they would receive packet zero, go, well, there's not supposed to be a packet zero and send back NAC. To which point the server would send packet zero again, it would get NAC and eventually the communication would time out and die. And some software would offer Y modem batch mode, which you could use that protocol and it would understand the packet zero and get the file name, ack it, and then the whole transfer could happen. If you did support this packet zero concept, it was also quite handy when downloading a single file because when you were choosing to save it on your machine, the file name would be filled in by default. You wouldn't have to make up your own file name. Right, let's park the history of BBSs there for a little bit and we're gonna get on to the disgustingly modern implementation of it. Now, I said I was gonna build a BBS in this video in the most obnoxiously modern way possible. So I should probably dig into what I actually mean by that. Now, I don't want to run a modern piece of BBS software. In fact, I think I want to run a DOS-based BBS application, but I don't want to do that by just firing up either just like a VM or sticking it on just a native bit of tin. What I want to do is run some retro software, but in a disturbingly modern way. We're going to try and do it like it's a modern cloud native kind of an application, because why the heck not? I mean, just because we're running legacy software doesn't mean we have to do it in a legacy way, right? Right? Come the end of this, I want this BBS to be accessible by not only modems, like we would have done back in the day, but also over the internet, because frankly, most of us don't need the ball ache of trying to run an actual modem over a phone line. In fact, I may just keep the dial-up bit internal to my house just so that I don't have to pay anyone for a phone line because monthly line rentals quite a lot and I'm pretty sure BT doesn't want to give me an actual phone line anymore. So let's get to how we're going to run this piece of DOS software. 
Now, you may have noticed I've not said which bit of DOS BBS software yet, and that's because I haven't chosen the DOS BBS software yet. But I do know how we're going to run our DOS environment. For a start, we're going to use DOSMU. Now, the reason for choosing this, and not DOSBox, is that DOSMU doesn't try to emulate the CPU, for example. I mean, I'm going to run this thing on x86, so it's fine if it just lets instructions from the application just hit the real CPU. That's that's just fine. DOSMU also gives us a pretty decent way to emulate a serial port in a way that just hooks up to a TCP IP socket. After all, we're trying to be modern, so we're not going to use serial ports for this stuff. The other reason for picking DOSMU is it's locking. DOSMU actually lets you have a Unix file system inside your DOS environment where file locking actually works properly. So if a DOS application inside DOSMU locks a file, that file will also get locked in the POSIX filing system that's been mounted in from the Unix world. This lets me fake up those larger environments where you might have more than one PC running your BBS software and using a shared file store like NetWare, for example, only without having to worry about putting all the NetWare client in there and having a NetWare server. I can just mount a shared blocker filing system from the Linux world inside DOSMU that all the machines just see as essentially a shared disk with working locking. Now, obviously for each of these Linux instances that's going to run DOSMU, I could do them in a virtual machine running on top of a hypervisor. And if I'd made this video maybe five or six years ago, that's exactly what I would have done. But I did say this video was going to be disturbingly modern. Yes, rather than a virtual machine, we're going to use a container. Now, a container differs quite a bit from how a virtual machine works. With a virtual machine, what you have is a hypervisor. And that hypervisor provides a layer that pretends to be various bits of hardware to the virtual machine. So it'll provide things like a hard disk controller, a network controller, a display controller. Sometimes those things might emulate pre-existing hardware, like a VGA card or an NE2000 network card. Most of the times they're using something known as para-virtualization, where they create a very thin wrapping between the corresponding device in your operating system and the virtual device that it provides to the operating system that's running in the VM, with drivers for those para-virtual devices needing to be installed into the operating system that's inside the guest. We also, for quite a while, have had some CPU hardware features that have meant it's fairly easy to accelerate these workloads as the operating system in the virtual guest can hit the CPU like it would as if it was just running on the native tin, including all the protected mode Ring Zero stuff, but it's not actually hitting the real Ring Zero for the processor, but the virtualized version that the CPU makes available to it. Now, why VMs gave us a great leap forward in terms of abstraction and how we sort out our workloads, it does come with a problem. You see, each VM is running a full kernel and all its libraries and all the memory and CPU load that that implies, having to go through these virtual devices to get access to the real resources of the computer. This is quite a lot of overhead so that normally we can just run one application inside this VM or service, so it's isolated from the other applications and programs that make up the service we want to provide to you know the rest of the world. Containerization simplifies this sort of stuff a lot. And it's been an evolving technology for a really long time. In fact, you could even trace its roots back to things like chroot, a command in Unix that lets you change where in the filing system the root of the tree is for the application that you're gonna launch. You can think of that as a really early precursor to this whole concept. We then have things like Solaris Zones and Linux's LXE until we eventually get to Docker, the thing that made containerization well known and popular. Admittedly, we're kind of moving on a little bit from the original Docker model now, with things like ContainerD, RunC, etc. But we'll stop off at Docker for a minute to do so I can explain how containers actually work. So containers differ from a virtual machine, in that with a virtual machine we have to pretend to be a whole computer and run an entire operating system inside of that. With containers, we don't pretend to have different virtual machines at all. We have one machine, the real machine, running a kernel and inside your kernel. And let's just switch to start saying Linux because that's the implementation basically everyone's using these days. So 
Our Linux kernel takes all the structures it represents back to user space. Like for example, the process table, the filing system, tree, your sockets, everything a process can see and get at in the kernel, and it adds the idea of namespaces to them. For every entry in these tables, they get flagged as to whether they belong to the root namespace, i.e. the normal user space that you'd see when you just logged into a Linux box normally or alternatively, the namespace belonging to a container. If a process in the root namespace requests any of these structures from the kernel, it will get back all the entries, including the ones in the root namespace and the container namespaces. If a process that's flagged as being in one of the container namespaces makes the same request, it will only get back entries that are in the same namespace as it. This effectively allows us to partition up our operating system into multiple containers that can't talk to things that run in the root and also can't talk to other containers. This model effectively isolates one thing in one namespace from things in other namespaces. Now, Docker took this whole concept and extended it just a little bit further. What Docker added was the idea of a layered file system into this, where you could take a series of file system images and layer one on top of the other. So you could have, for example, a base filing system that's a simple CentOS 7 install, for example. You could then layer, for example, a web server on top of that, like Apache. On top of that, you could then layer your PHP install, and then finally, on top of that, the PHP application you want to run. Now, what Docker did was give us tools so that we could build these layered filing systems and also store them in a remote repository. Then, on the machine you actually want to run the Docker container on, you can say, I want to run this Docker container that contains the image of my PHP application. Docker would then pull down your CentOS 7 layer, your Apache layer, your PHP layer, and finally, the PHP application layer you requested, and in the filing system, mount those all on top of each other, and then finally, create the container with that layered file system as the root of the file system tree. Docker also gave you in that image a way to specify what is the thing that should be run when the container starts. So in the example of our PHP application, we might just start Apache. Now, this gives us a huge advantage compared to the whole virtual machine approach. Firstly, we got this whole library of pre-baked images all ready to go that we can just use or extend. And second of all, all of this is way easier on the actual machine that's got to run all of this stuff. In a VM, you've got all the overhead of a second kernel and abstracting everything through virtual devices. In a container, running the software is no more effort than if you just run it, well, not in the container on the machine itself. Because the thing running inside the container is just running on the machine itself pretty normally. The only difference being that the entries in the table related to this process have a different namespace other than the root namespace. Also, if two containers have a shared layer in their disk system that contains a library that the application makes use of, the kernel knows that that's the same library, and thus can do the trick it would normally do with libraries that are not in containers, which is they share the same memory space. After all, why have the same library in memory more than once? If something tries to modify in memory that library once it's loaded, well then the kernel can just use its copy on modify trick, so only the process that's making the modification gets to see the difference. So this is the prime reason that containers have really taken off. They're a lot more resource efficient, but they're also a lot more efficient for the people trying to run these systems. As if we just want things like a web server or memcache, we don't have to do this whole thing from scratch. We can either just use a pre-built image as is, or we can use it as the layer for the base of the container we're going to build with our own local changes and modifications in. And once we build that, put it in our own repository so we can use it on our servers. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a base Linux image and I'm going to create an image with DOSMU in it. And then I'll take that DOSMU image and then I'll extend that further to add the BBS software. Now, with DOSMU being a fairly commonly used thing, there is a reasonable chance that there is a DOSMU image out there that I can just use with either no modifications or just tinker a bit for my use case. So that's where I went to Docker Hub and I did indeed find an image that was already built based off Debian with DOSMU in it that would, well, do the job quite nicely for me. And that's when I spotted something interesting. The same user who created the DOSMU base image had also created an image that extended his DOSMU image with some BBS software in it. Suddenly, this project got a lot, lot simpler. Now, some of you may have listened to that whole Docker section and thought, my, so that's the frighteningly modern part, right? Please say that's the frighteningly modern part. Well, no, it turns out we got a lot more frighteningly modern to go. You see, I'm trying to build this like this is a modern cloud-type enterprise system. And from that point of view, just plain Docker presents us with a problem. 
In plain Docker, we, you know, would log onto a machine, run the container on there, and any other containers we need. We'd also have to set up any shared storage those containers need, all the networking stuff, etc. The problem with that is, though, it's just one machine. If we're building this as a proper service, we can't be in the situation where if one machine dies, no matter how reliable that machine is, the whole service has gone with it. And once we know we want to run it on multiple machines, all this hand logging into boxes and setting up Docker containers and trying to do load balances and other stuff by hand is, well, just not going to cut it, because we need to be able to take nodes in and out of this system. We need to be able to take nodes down for maintenance, add other nodes when we need more capacity, or just the original hardware is getting a bit old. What we really need is an orchestration system that sets up all these containers for us and can handle nodes being removed and added. Well, luckily that system exists, and it's called Kubernetes, or, if you're feeling particularly American, Kubernetes in some cases. If you're already aware of Kubernetes and pronounce it a different way, well, for the rest of the video, I'm going to pronounce it Kubernetes, and you're going to have to make peace with that fact. Now, Kubernetes is a system that can install on multiple nodes. But for the purposes of this video, and the sake of my electricity bill, I'm just going to set it up and install it on this one HP node here. I mean, I'll go over the details of the HP node later. But just bear in mind throughout the whole of this conversation about Kubernetes, it's a multi-node system. Normally, you'd have lots of nodes in your Kubernetes cluster, and we have to build everything, assuming that there are going to be multiple nodes. Because at some point, I might want to add another node to this BBS service and take some nodes out, for example. Now, what Kubernetes lets us do is specify what we want the system to end up looking like. We don't tell Kubernetes how to do that. We don't tell it which nodes it's going to put containers on. We just specify how many containers we would like, the spec of those containers, that they might have some file storage linked up to them, or in fact the same file storage linked up to all of the containers in some instances, and which containers we might like to talk to others. All we do is specify what, not how. It's Kubernetes' job to work out the how. We just give it the list of things we want it to build, and then it gets on and tries to make that true. In the event that it has insufficient resource to make this true, well, it will tell you. And that's also why later on you'll see me specifying the amount of memory and RAM I want a container to have access to. So Kubernetes knows how much it's going to need to fulfill my requests, but also police those containers so they don't consume more than I said that they could. All right, so let's start getting this server set up. Now, this is just going to be an overview of the steps I took to get this working. This is not a how-to by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, this video is going to be long enough without me doing that. If you want to find a tutorial on any of these steps that I do, the, well, YouTube's absolutely littered with them. If you are interested, however, in setting up your own Kubernetes cluster, this will at least give you an overview of the steps that are involved, even if all the detail as to exactly how you do it is not really presented in this thing. Right, so let's take our HPDL 380 and we power it up and the first thing we do is go into its provisioning section through the BIOS and set ourselves up one mirrored RAID. This one mirrored RAID is going to act as our boot disk effectively where the OS is going to go. The other disks in here, yeah, I'm not going to put them into a logical volume. I'm just going to leave those because we're going to use that for storage in the Kubernetes cluster later. We'll, we'll cycle back to that bit. So after I've got this logical volume, I network boot this thing so I can PXE load Rocky 9 onto it, which is a distribution of Linux. Once it's installed, I install IPMI utils so I can quickly set up the IPMI controller on this thing. I then install the HP RAID tool so I can manage the RAID array, and also the HP plugin for lib storage management CLI so I can use that rather than HP's own utility. But that plugin actually requires HP's RAID util to work. It also means that all the other bits of software that can make use of lib storage management can actually pull data out of the RAID controller properly. I then set up some basic firewall rules in this thing using firewall D, pop some SSH keys on to make management of it a little bit easier, we're then ready to install Kubernetes. Now, there is more than one way to install Kubernetes, but I'm going to use a distribution known as K3S because it's a bit more lightweight than some of the other ways of doing this. 
and is also a lot more geared around running a single node than some of the other distributions. Now in production, I wouldn't do it this way, I'd probably use a tool like Rancher to build the Kubernetes cluster for me, but as I could really do without introducing another layer of abstraction into this video, and I really want this thing to be able to run by itself without any more infrastructure, I'm going with K3S. Now as you can see, we can bootstrap a K3S node pretty easily, we just, this one line does it and installs everything. Now there is a slightly more complicated way to do that, but we don't need that for this video. So once that's installed, our Kubernetes cluster is up and running with a single node, and we can start asking it some basic questions just to check that it's alive and happy with the kubectrl command. Yes, the installer did drop a copy of the authentication certificate for this in my home directory. Now for our next step, we are about to use something called Helm. Helm is a system for installing stuff into a Kubernetes cluster. Ordinarily, we'd specify what we want Kubernetes to build in a whole bunch of YAML files. Helm gives you a way of grouping a bunch of those YAML files together in an installable project, known as a Helm chart. It also does a bit more than that. It gives us a bit of templating and a way to do variables so that we can specify some parameters when we get Helm to install something. Now, this is the first and the last time we are going to use Helm at the command line to do this, because we're going to install something called Argo CD. And this is hopefully one of the last layers of abstraction I'm going to introduce. Argo, once it's installed, connects up to a Git repository. And in that Git repository, you put a number of files, again, all in YAML, that define the applications we'd like to have installed on our Kubernetes cluster. And those application definitions could be pretty simple. It can just be, hey, I want an application called Dave. I want it to go into this namespace and I want it to install from this Helm chart. The key thing is here, once you commit one of these to Git and push it, Helm will notice what you've done and apply those changes to Kubernetes. Also, if you happen to have access to the Kubernetes cluster and went on and manually fiddled something, well, Argo would notice that the state in Kubernetes is different from the one source of truth that's committed into Git and would revert those changes you made to Kubernetes back out. That way, any rules we apply to Git around needing to do branches and merge requests so you can get changes made, well, that can all be enforced by Git. It also means whoever has admin access to the cluster doesn't have to be the same person that's committing things in. And it also makes auditing change and rolling back anything that goes spectacularly wrong a heck of a lot easier because it's all version controlled. Now, admittedly, this is not something I particularly need for a system run by just me, but I am trying to build this in the kind of way that you do it in production, just at a somewhat reduced scale with a smaller electricity bill. I'm now going to introduce the last bit of technology in this stack. Now, if you remember earlier, I said that we were going to run multiple containers with DOSMU and the bulletin board system inside there, and that all these containers would have a shared bit of filing system that contains the bulletin board data files. After all, it's not like this thing has an SQL backend it's going to talk to. Now, in order to do this, we need a system that can survive any node in the cluster dying, so we can't have the filing system dependent on any node in the cluster staying alive. If you remember, we're building this as if it's going to be a multi-node system, even though I'm just going to use the one node to start with. Electricity bills. So this is where we're going to use something known as Ceph. Ceph provides us a way of doing a multiple read-write filing system on top of its block storage engine. Now, that block storage engine is what gives us the distributed nature of this filing system. Ceph has what's known as an OSD, an object storage daemon, and those can be placed on a whole bunch of computers. When you create a filing system on top of that, you tell it how redundant you want that to be, i.e. the data must be stored in at least three places. Ceph then has what's known as a crush map that works out where it can store that data and which bits are dependent on another. So in its most complicated scenario, what you can add into that crush map is that every server is in a rack and every disk is in a server. If you specify that any data must be in at least three places, well, Ceph will then try and make that in three separate racks based on the crush map. If there aren't three separate racks of server, well, then it will try and put it all in different servers at the very least and try and get at least one copy into a different rack if it can. If you happen to be building a setup like mine, well, then there's only one server and one rack, so it will just try and put it on three separate disks. If I did suddenly add another node, well, then it would try and move the data around so the data was at least on one other server. And if I got to the point where there were multiple servers and then suddenly I gained multiple racks of servers, well, then it would try and distribute the data across multiple racks. Now, see if can be quite complicated to set up, but luckily for Kubernetes, there is a project known as Rook that makes this a lot, lot simpler for us. 
Rook is what is known in the world of Kubernetes as an operator. And an operator just sits there waiting for you to define some objects in Kubernetes that tells it what you want. Once those objects are defined, Rook goes ahead and builds that setup for you. So we're going to use Argo to install Rook, and then we're going to make ourselves a few Helm charts that Argo can install that tells Rook what we would like. And in those Helm charts, we specify things like how many monitor instances we would like. In Ceph, the monitor is the thing that knows where everything is stored. It maintains the index of which storage objects pertain to which file system, for example, and on what OSDs those storage objects are placed. And if an OSD ever goes away or a new one appears, the monitors are responsible for telling the OSDs, the object storage demons, where new copies of the object should be placed or be moved to. The other part we're going to tell it is how many metadata servers we want. The reason we need and want these is because when we set up a Ceph filing system, we need something to do all the POSIX -y bits, essentially handle the metadata for what files there are, access times, modify times, locking, etc. And that's what these metadata servers are doing. They're handling all those operations and keeping it all in memory and back flushing it to an OSD with the monitor telling it which OSD to write to. The final bit we do is we finally need to tell it which disks in the system we want OSD setting up for. Now, if you remembered, I've got 14 one terabyte SAS disks that we haven't put in a RAID array yet. So what we do is we define one logical volume for one physical disk. So the operating system can now see these disks. We then create a YAML definition that is going to tell Rook which disks we want an OSD setting up for. And once that's synced by Argo into Kubernetes, the Rook controller picks that up and starts setting up OSD demons for each one of these disks, handling the formatting and everything, until eventually they come up ready and working. We now have a solution, whereas if we added another node, this storage would become available to it, but also on that new node, well, we could specify the disks that are on there we're going to want OSDs for, and Rook would add them all into the cluster and start replicating a copy of the data out to that node until it's all ready. At which point, if we lost the original node, no big deal, everything still keeps ticking, all the filing systems are available and writable to. The final bit we need to do is set up something called the CSI, the Container Storage Interface. Kubernetes has a series of plugins available to it that essentially let it use lots of different storage types, and it needs one for Ceph. So again, we just make a little Helm chart for that, and Argo takes care of installing it for us into Kubernetes. Now Kubernetes knows how to use Ceph and allocate storage from it, we just need to define that we want a shared multiple read, multiple write filing system, and Rook then gets on with setting up the storage pools for that and allocating the metadata server containers to look after those filing systems. And then we have storage that's ready to use by our DOSMU containers. As a brief aside, if we were at some point to set up a whole other cluster, Ceph is capable of replicating a copy of this filing system out to it. The other cluster would then be able to mount it and read and write to it at the same time. But what this allows us to do is to instantly move a service over from one place to another cluster and just flip the direction of replication or shut it down, which is a pretty big deal if you're running in multiple data centers in different bits of the world. It should be noted that this is not the same as backup. You can't revert it back to how it was a couple of hours ago from the remote replicated copy. This is more about being able to migrate workloads between data centers. While we're on the topic of backup, another application we'll throw in via Argo is Valero, our backup tool. Now, this Helm chart happens to contain the whole Valero backup application, but locally we've also added some things like default times to do some backups and a default backup storage location, all of which can be specified as little values that we override in the main chart in the definition file that Argo uses to install this thing. I bet you wish a complete backup solution was that simple for like everything else you'd ever done, right? Right, let's get back to the history of bulletin boards for a minute or two. Some BBSs would allow you to have what was known as a door. This is where your BBS software would execute an external program, which would then be able to send and receive data to your user. So the door software would know which user it was, etc. Your BBS software would write to the disk what's known as a drop file that contained all that information that the door application could open and read. Now, the most common use for doors was games. Now, admittedly, all these games have to be text-based, or at least ASCII art-based, and be able to work with the kind of latencies you'd get over a modem and a public telephone line. 
So common things you'd see is things like text adventure games, but you'd also see MUDs, multi-user dungeons, which is like a text adventure game, only with multiple people all being in the same world and being able to talk and interact with each other, or, you know, hit each other with pointed sticks. But you'd also see games like Trade Wars that is text-based, but is definitely not a text adventure game. And for those who are playing these games, this would have been their first experience of online gameplay, where you get to play with other people over your modem. Admittedly, not a lot of people at once, because most BBSs didn't have a ton of modems, they maybe had, you know, one or two, maybe even four or five if they were particularly posh. And not everyone dialing up would have wanted to play the same door game. So quite frequently, in the games that worked for multiple users, there was just the one user and that was you. You would sometimes make arrangements with other people on the bulletin board to, you know, all dial in at the same time and play. But it's amazing how many scheduling conflicts there could be, and also how keen sometimes your parents were to let you make use of the phone line would vary. Particularly in the UK, where we still got charged for local calls, so although calling your local bulletin board was cheaper than calling one that wasn't in the same area as you, it, it still cost money. So when school let you use the modem was quite frequently when online gameplay would take place. Later on, you'd also get the concept of a door link program, which is a door that your BBS software could run that would effectively telnet over to another machine where the game would run. Now, that wasn't typically telnetting to a machine over the internet because we don't have common access to the internet yet, but you would find it on larger bulletin boards that had outgrown what a single computer could do and where there would be, say, for example, multiple PCs, each with a set of modems that would share data files using a file server, something like NetWare or Blantastic or LAN Manager. You would then see these link doors essentially telnetting from whichever machine you dialed in to whichever shared host is running the game. This is much more of a big BBS thing than a small BBS thing. Although, as you start getting that overlap between dial-up internet becoming a thing and BBS is still being in use, you would see doors becoming available to, again, link you to a game on a remote system, but you'd also see some internet services being made available. For example, the local BBS I used to use offered an FTP door where you could essentially use that door, enter an FTP path for a file that you wanted off the internet, and that door would go grab the file and let you start Y modeming it down. For larger files, you could either leave the door or disconnect, and it would essentially fetch the file and message it to you in the bulletin board's internal messaging system, an FTP to mail gateway. You would also see email gateways as well that would let you make use of internet email addresses. And when you did, you would email their usual username at mail domain, and they would see it coming from an email address, which was your BBS username percent, the email address of the mailbox that the BBS was using. So I, I can't remember my BBS username, but I was something percent name of the BBS at demon.co.uk. And that was my first internet email address. Now, admittedly, fairly shortly after that, I started just dialing the internet directly myself. So this was towards the very end of BBS is being a popular thing that people would use. But for those lucky few of us whose local BBS happened to offer these internet doors, it gave us our first taste of the internet as well, or at least some of the things that we could use the internet for. In my case, I was even lucky enough to have a telnet door on there, so I could telnet into very early FTP search engines, like Archie, for example, which I think was running at Imperial College, or at least the version I used was, to let me search for files, and then I could use the FTP gateway door to then download said file. I think that's how I first accessed AmiNet. Time to switch back to our modern implementation stuff. Now, you've probably noticed our cluster is set up and doing quite a lot of things, but one of the things it's not doing yet is running our BBS container. Now, if you remembered earlier, I said I'd get into the details a little bit of a Helm chart. Well, this is where we're going to do it, because we're going to define the Helm chart that sets up our BBS containers. Now, again, this isn't a tutorial. This is just a whistle-stop tour of what I'm doing, because I'm guessing this is going to be a really long video when I edit it together. But I'm going to introduce the key concepts that you need to know for this to make sense. The main unit of getting stuff done in Kubernetes is what's known as a pod. You can think of a pod as a number of containers that are defined as running together on the same local host, which means they can have bits of 
shared storage between the containers for things like on-disk sockets, etc. And they have a number of parameters that they share, like a CPU or a RAM limit. And you can add some access control around the pod as well. So for our basic pod definition, we say things like, we want to run the container that's got our BBS image in it. We also define points in that container where we'd like to mount some storage in. And finally, after that, we do something that's known as a volume claim, where we can say, we want to have so many gigabytes of storage that can be read and written to by multiple pods at the same time. And that's so we can have that shared storage between pods that our BBS files can live in, so we can run more than one of these pods and handle multiple serial connections on each one. You might now be wondering, how do we tell Kubernetes how many of these pods we want it to fire up? Well, rather than just defining the pod, Kubernetes gives us two kinds of objects that we can define, a replica set and a stateful set. Although these days you probably wrap a replica set in a deployment, but let's explain what a replica set is. They both consist of a pod definition and a field that tells it how many of these pods you would like. Kubernetes, once it gets this replica set definition, then sets up the number of pods you've told it to, assuming it has enough CPU and memory to do it. You can give it some placement rules about try not to put all of these on the same node, please. However, your replica set or deployment are stateless pods. There's no data to preserve in them. When a pod gets killed, a new one gets created, and there's no data to carry over from one to the other. All the instances of the pod are exactly the same. Of course, that's no use for something like a database or RBBS, where we do have state data being stored inside the pods. You know, a database has files with, you know, the data in it, and so does RBBS for that matter. So for that, we have the stateful set, a set of pods that have, you know, a state. And if one of the stateful pods within the stateful set gets murdered, well, it gets recreated and glued back up to the exact set of storage that it was connected to before. Now, the other thing we need to take care of is what happens when the pod gets started for the first ever time. We need something to set up the initial file content in that shared blocker filing system that is our BBS's data store. And for that, we have an init container, a container that starts when the stateful set first brings up the pod, and that's going to check to see, do we have the content in that directory that we need? If not, it will download it and uncompress the content into the right directory. So we have an initial version of the BBS to play with. Now, the Docker container I've borrowed for this with Renegade BBS in it, it happens to have those files directly baked into the image. But as we're going to mount a chunk of shared storage across the top of that, that's not ideal. So I take that image and modify it so it's got a script in it that allows it to download the Renegade software and expand it all that our init container can make use of. Now, whilst I'm talking around the container, we'll have a quick look through how this works. As it's been packaged particularly nicely, we have a base image, and then on top of that, we have another layer containing DOSMU. Then there's a layer on top of that that contains all our doors. And then finally, there's a number of BBS images available that all make use of that doors layer. And the one I've chosen is Renegade, which is a bit of multi-node BBS software, and is the one I was thinking about running for this thing all along. The other alternative I think of was the commercial offering Wildcat, but then I started looking into the licensing for that, and apparently, yeah, that they're still charging for it. It's still a thing you can purchase, so we, we won't renegade. Now, the way in which it's been structured is, if you turn that into the container, it starts a new DOSMU session that then runs the renegade software. And the renegade software sees your connection as a serial port via its fossil driver. And when it starts renegade, it hands over a node number. This is so the sysop can see which users are logged into which node. And baked into the DOSMU layer of this container system, it's also added the idea of a DOS session number, so for each connection that comes in, it invokes a DOS session, that session has a number. And to avoid two people getting the same session number, the session numbers, along with a series of locks and what's going on, is all kept in the slash DOS slash sessions directory. And although that's not the most cloud scale solution for doing this, we're running a DOS-based BBS that also uses file locking, so it's fine, we can have that mounted into each pod as shared storage, with the session files in, and locking will work across them because CFFS maintains the whole POSIX semantics thing across multiple uses of the set filing system. So if you lock a file in one pod, it locks on another pod, even if that pod's on an entirely different computer. And this is not really a scaling issue because it's a DOS BBS and we're limited by the same file locking system for the actual BBS data files themselves. So back to the Kubernetes definition, we've got our stateful set with all our mounts in, including the sessions directory, other things we add are a service so that we can tell that into 
all the pods that we have running. Admittedly, we're just going to go for one in our stateful set. We also add a service for the VNC server. As that's acting as an X11 server, so all the DOSMU instances have something they can draw on, because they expect there to be a screen. We also add a little secret, which I'm not going to show you, that sets the password for the VNC server, so that's managed in Kubernetes and not baked into the image. We also give this thing its own service account to run under under Kubernetes so that it can have all its interactions with, and so it doesn't gain any privileges we don't want it to. And once Argo gets that installed and running, there we go, we have our BBS that we can telnet into. Although that service I'm not going to expose to the public, we'll come on to how we're going to let people into this thing later on. So one of the goals for this is to be accessible via a modem. And there are a couple of ways I could achieve this. One way that's quite tempting is to use some equipment from the period of the end of the era of dial-up internet, as it's basically the final evolutionary form of this kind of technology. So I could take my Cisco ASA, which connects via a number of primary rate ISDN lines, which is the posh businessy version of ISDN that gives you 30 channels. And this box has a whole bunch of 56K modems in it, basically. And when you dialed it up, it used radius to authenticate you, and that radius server would tell the ASA what to do. For dial-up internet, it was pretty much terminate the PPP session, and it would handle taking IP packets in over its Ethernet interface and shoveling down the PPP interface and taking stuff from the PPP interface and sticking it out over Ethernet. But you could also use Radius to tell it just to telnet across to another machine. And it would handle the whole telnetting part and just take whatever it got over telnet, shove it down the modem, take whatever it gets over the modem and shove it out over telnet. I mean, it's a pretty simple protocol. And that would work really nicely for our PBS. But there's a but where I have another Cisco box that can provide primary rate ISDN out to the ASA and either take analog phone lines in or produce analog phone lines out to my various devices around the house so I could dial in that way. Both of these are quite old, quite big boxes. And even though I've refurbished their power supplies for a show I did in Cambridge a couple of years ago, they eat a surprising amount of electricity. So I'm not sure I want to leave them just sitting there running, consuming all this power for a service I'm not going to be using all the time inside my house. It also doesn't solve overly well letting people from the outside world dial in as well if that's a thing I want to do without having an analog telephone line I just plug into the thing. Because if I was going to do that, I'd use an external VoIP provider and I don't want a 20 year old Cisco VoIP switch being allowed to talk to things on the actual internet. Yeah, this thing's not received security updates for a very, very long time. So what I've decided I'm going to do instead is solve this with a bit of software called Asterisk. Asterisk is a software VoIP PBX, basically a phone system that runs in software, largely using SIP. And to it, I'm going to connect a couple of SIP ATAs that can let my modem talk VoIP to it. The reason for selecting Asterisk is because there is a module you can build for it that allows you to pretend to be a modem. Not a particularly fast modem, but one that's more than good enough for the machines I'm going to use to dial up my disturbingly modern BBS implementation. So we're going to make ourselves a Docker container because we're going to run this thing on the same cluster. As part of the build process for that container, we're going to compile Asterisk and the new modem module and get it all linked in there with enough config to get it all set up and running. We're then going to define ourselves a Helm chart to deploy this thing. And here you can see I'm defining the pod and telling it to use the container that we've just built with the version of Asterisk in it that's got the modem add-on. Now, I'll quickly introduce a new concept in here that Kubernetes gives us a good way to manage config files outside of the container. We just mount them in like this. And then that config file becomes manageable separately from the container itself. We don't need to embed the config files in there. We can now manage them as separate objects in our YAML file. So it's fairly easy for us to make a change to this chart that alters the configuration of Asterix, and Argo CD will just fire up and change the config for us. That'll make working with SIP ATAs a little bit easier. With this all set up inside the cluster, now we can connect our SIP ATA up to Asterisk, place a phone call to it with our modem, Asterisk will answer the call with its little virtual modem, they will have a conversation, establish a data rate, and then Asterisk will telnet to the service of the BBS, because that's what we've configured it to do. That service will select one of our pods, and it will fire up a copy of DOS MU with our DOS BBS in it, with the data files all mounted off that bit of shared storage that Cease provided. And thus, we have a cloud-native dial-up BBS.
So apart from making a possible public modem service available, how am I going to let the public into our BBS? Well, I don't just want them telnetting in. I don't want to expose the IP address of my whole home network and cluster to the outside world. And also, most people's terminal software isn't set up in the right way to make all the DOS ANSI control sequences work properly. What I'm going to use is a web-based terminal known as ftelnet. Now, this is all written in JavaScript, and it conveniently handles all the DOS ANSI control characters for us properly, so this is going to look like we intend it to, but it's also designed to use a WebSocket server. After all, JavaScript wouldn't be very secure if it let you just start telnetting to stuff. So I'm going to end up serving ftelnet from a random box out on the internet, and I'll set up a rev proxy in there that will take all the WebSocket stuff back, and I'll expose a WebSocket server from my cluster at home to that rev proxy. So how that'll look is I'll have a pod that'll end up running WebSockify. It'll be configured to telnet to the service I've exposed in the BBS namespace that connects us to the BBS. And finally, I'll set up an ingress that will expose WebSockify to my public web service IP address so the ref proxy can connect into it. And so that's how everyone will be able to get access via that web page, the host F telnet. Now, I know some of you will be itching to jump straight to that website now and start using it and playing and... Well, depending on when you watch this video, that, that might work. But so far, this process has taken me well, well over a month to get this all built and get the video filmed and edited and the voiceover done, etc. That's not left me with a lot of time to test this with other people before the video goes live. So depending on when you watch this, I may still be testing this with a fairly close-knit group and potentially hunting down problems and fixing things. So when you've watched this, I'll put a link in the description to the second channel. Go look at the second channel, and if there's a video that's entitled, I've launched the BBS, well then I've launched the BBS, feel free to go try it. If that video is not there, I have not launched the BBS yet, you will struggle to try it. Although if I know you and you want to like come and try, just, just, just message me. So all the way through this video, I've been threatening to talk about FidoNet. Well, now he's finally that moment. FidoNet was a way for BBSs to exchange messages with each other. Now, I'm not going to dig into its whole background story because there's more than one, and this video is already pretty darn long. Uh, go look at Wikipedia if you really want to know the backstories. But initially, it allowed one user on a BBS to message another user on a different BBS. And the way that would work is when you were filling in your message, you would also fill in a node number. And in the middle of the night, your BBS would dial up that other node and take all the messages that was meant for that node and pass them to that node. Now, soon that system needed a bit more structure in it because they'd grown to 250 nodes and some of them were, well, were not near the other nodes. So the idea of a network number was introduced. And BBSs that were all roughly in the same area would all be grouped together under the same network number. So instead of just typing in a basic node number, you'd type the network number followed by a slash and then the node number. Now all the nodes in the network would all dial the one host where the owner had volunteered to make the long distance phone calls, pass all the messages to the different networks to that one. That host would then dial up the remote networks and pass all the messages to that host. In turn, that host or PBS would then pass the messages to all the individual nodes in its network. Hence, 12 year old me could dial from my school a local BBS and send a message to anyone in the world who was also on FinderNet. Now, some of you use FinderNet going, but I didn't just use it to email individuals. And no, you're right, because what got layered on top of this is something known as echo mail. You see, someone came up with the bright idea that maybe it'd be nice if not just sending messages to individuals, you could have a message that was shared and visible to everyone on FidoNet. And that's what echo mail allowed you to do. You could post to, for example, the SysOp group, and that would get copied to every single node in the network. But soon, other shared forums started to appear, like Tech, GayNet, Clang. And suddenly, the volume of traffic doing this sort of shared posting environment overtook the user-to-user -user messaging system in terms of the volume of data being shipped around. Now, some of you are thinking this sounds pretty similar to Usenet. Yeah, you're right, it is. At its peak, there was around 20,000 FidoNet nodes and around 4 million users. And that was around 1993. But as you all know, the internet started to become a thing and people started to dial that up. And soon, well, while the internet had helped reduce the cost of doing net-to-net -net transfers for FidoNet, most of the users on FidoNet had stopped using their local BBS and had got themselves an internet connection. 
If you've made it all the way to the end of this video, I would like to say thank you very much for watching. I know this was a particularly long video. For the retro enthusiasts amongst you, you've learnt a lot more about Docker, Kubernetes and Sieve than you probably ever wanted to. And for the Kubernetes people, you've now seen how you can run a DOS workload inside the Kubernetes cluster. Feel free to go bleach your eyeballs. If you enjoyed the video, please click that button that YouTube's created to indicate that fact, because goodness knows this video is going to need the help. I mean, the overlap in the Venn diagram of people who are into Kubernetes and people who are into DOS BBSs is probably a pretty small overlap. Heck, it may only contain just me. As ever, the comment section is open. Please feel free to discuss everything we've talked about in this video, because honestly, you guys do create some interesting insights into this stuff. I'm particularly looking forward to hearing about some of the BBS history and experiences. Also, it'd be nice to chat to all five of you who happen to be in the Venn diagram overlap with me. And in general, if you'd like to help the channel out, why not press that subscribe button? Because it's free, and it helps the YouTube algorithm tell people that these videos actually exist.